I'm Sheila Donegan from Maths Week. Welcome to the Hamilton Walk 2020. It's a bit different this year, but it's great to have so many people from all around the world tuning in. Owen was just on his way to Dunsink. He got held up uh, for a few minutes. He's waiting for Peter Gallagher in Dunsink to open the gate. Hi, Sheila. <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm just here in Dunsink. Can you hear me? Hello, Sheila. Hi. Yeah. Oh, we can hear you loud and clear. We're looking forward to starting the walk. <clears throat> OK. Are you ready for me? Absolutely. Yeah, we're all here, ready to go. OK. Are you are we uh, switched over? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay, here we go. Um, welcome to the Hamilton Walk 2020. It's a little different. Okay, can you can you hear me again, Sheila? Hello. Owen. Yes. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go on the walk now. Hello. My name is Owen Gill, and you're very welcome to come along with me today on the Hamilton Walk. We're here in Dunsink, which is to the west of Dublin. It's about eight kilometres from Dublin city centre, and it's home to Dunsink Observatory, which in turn was home to Sir William Rowan Hamilton, who in 1843, on this day, set out to walk into Dublin to chair a meeting of the Royal Irish Academy. He set out to walk with his wife Helen and they walked into mathematical history. The route took them across the fields and down Dunsinay Lane to Ashtown where they met the Royal Canal. And they walked along the canal in towards Dublin but their journey was interrupted at Broom Bridge when Hamilton had an epiphany. And this is a story that has gone down in the history of mathematics. And it's the story that we are gathered together today to commemorate. Now, the good folks of Maynooth University established this walk and this commemoration 30 years ago. And we felt that it was really important in this time of COVID to keep this tradition alive. So even though we can't meet in person as we are used to, 
We can extend this invitation to people all over the world to join us, wherever you may be. We're all joined together through an interest in mathematics, in history and heritage, and in our shared humanity. So let us proceed to the observatory. And we're now joined by Professor Peter Gallagher, uh, who is our host here at Dunsink. Thanks, Owen, and welcome everybody to Dunsink Observatory here in Dublin 15. I'm delighted to bring you in and show you this beautiful campus that uh, we look after nowadays. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can just see this dark, ominous thing, and that's the South Dome. And inside it, there's a large telescope that we still use. And um, hopefully after Christmas, you can come along maybe and come and have a look at the stars, or it's always lovely to look at the moon through that telescope. We're zooming around here now up to the main part of the building or the observatory, which is Observatory House. And it's in this building that William Rowan Hamilton did all of his work. He was actually appointed a professor of, of astronomy at the age of 21. And he worked here until he was, I think, 65 when he finally passed away. So he lived here and did all of his work here. Now, Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, DIAS, now runs the facility. And uh, some of us are lucky enough to work in the building again. And uh, we're also very happy to welcome members of the public um, and people from schools to come and visit the observatory and, and, and learn about the history. The first room here on the right hand side in the building is the Hamilton Room. And it's in this room that we really celebrate William Rowan Hamilton's work and his life. And you can see some of these books that we have with a huge collection of books by Hamilton uh, that tell about you know, his life, his mathematical work. Um, and also there's even some poetry by Iggy McGovern from Trinity College Dublin that talk about, uh, that are all about Hamilton and his life. I love this book here with all the equations just showing how complicated some of the work was that he did. Now Hamilton was born in Dublin 1 and um, this is a plaque that was in uh, Dominic Street, Street and we now have it in our observatory and it sits beside this book cabinet in which we have some of William Owen Hamilton's own handwriting. So these are quaternions and this is him playing around with the algebra, a quaternion algebra. And uh, also there's some star positions. So he may have been getting bored of, his, uh, of doing some astronomical, tedious astronomical work and decided to play with some quaternions. Now he was he came up with the brilliant idea, the flash of brilliance for quaternions while walking along the Royal Canal. And this photo, this, this uh, charcoal drawing, in fact, uh, shows him writing the quaternion equations on Broom Bridge with his wife. Now we're going to swing on down through the observatory, uh, down through um, past all the rooms, past the staircase up to the researchers' uh, offices. And then we'll swing down through the time corridor where Dublin Standard Time or Dublin Mean Time actually was kept. That's the dent clock there. There's a couple of other clocks. This, there's a synchronome there on the left hand side. And um, this kept Dublin Mean Time up until 1916. And there was a little quote there that by James Joyce, who actually wrote about uh, Dublin Time or Dunsink Time and Time Ball at Ballast House being down. This room here is probably the beating heart of the observatory. This is where the observations of the stars were made in the past. It's now a lecture room and you can come along to, to hear uh, people talking all about the stars and galaxies and so on. Uh, but this part of the room is where there was a shutter that was opened up. And at this point, there was a meridian telescope that uh, was used to track the transit of stars across the, the, the building. And it was used to set longitude and to set time. And if you peer out through this little window, you can see the pillars. These are the meridian pillars and such, you're peering straight along the meridian line of Dublin, which is 25 minutes and 21 uh, seconds uh, off Greenwich Mean Time. So hopefully in the future we might reinstate that uh, meridian line so that people can come along and take selfies like they do at, at the Greenwich Meridian. Thanks, Owen. Falterov. This is Fiacra O'Carabra, and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Hamilton Walk. It all started on a bright Monday morning on October the 16th, 1843. Hamilton was walking along the banks of the Royal Canal with his wife Helen, on his way from Dunsink Observatory into town. As he passed Broom Bridge in Cabra, he had a eureka moment. A spark flashed forth, as he said, and he created 
a strange new system of numbers called quaternions. Now number couples, or two-dimensional numbers, have been important in mathematics and science for working in two-dimensional geometry. And Hamilton was trying to extend his theory of number couples to a theory of number triples, or triplets. He hoped these triplets would provide a natural mathematical structure and a new way for describing our three-dimensional world in the same way that the number couples played a significant role in two-dimensional geometry. But he was having a difficult time defining the multiplication operation in his quest for a suitable theory of triplets. And we now know why. Because it's actually impossible to construct the suitable theory of triplets he was pursuing. Then on that famous day, on October the 16th, 1843, Hamilton's mind gave birth to quaternions in a flash of inspiration as he walked along the banks of the Royal Canal at Broome Bridge. And in a 19th century act of graffiti, he scratched his quaternion formulas on the bridge. Hamilton realized that if you worked with number quadruples, and an unusual multiplication operation, then you would get everything he desired and more. He named his new system of numbers quaternions because each number, quadruple, had four components. He had created a totally new structure in mathematics. The mathematical world was shocked at his audacity in creating a system of numbers that did not satisfy the usual commutative rule for multiplication, which is the rule that says 2 times 3 is 3 times 2. In his quaternions, xy was not necessarily the same as yx. Hamilton has been called the liberator of algebra because his quaternions smashed the previously accepted convention that a useful algebraic number system should satisfy the rules of ordinary numbers in arithmetic. His quaternions opened up a whole new mathematical landscape in which mathematicians were now free to conceive new algebraic number systems that were not shackled by the rules of ordinary numbers in arithmetic. So we may say that modern algebra was born on October the 16th, 1843, on the banks of the Royal Canal in Dublin. I like to say, one small scratch for a man, one giant leap for mathematics. Hamilton's creation of quaternions is commemorated with a plaque at Broom Bridge. Now the fact that xy is not necessarily the same as yx in Hamilton's quaternions is actually not that unnatural. So even though for ordinary numbers in arithmetic, xy is equal to yx, xy not equal to yx is actually quite a natural thing. For example, when you reverse two operations in many situations, you get completely different results. For example, and I don't suggest you do this at home, if you take an empty swimming pool and take the two op operations of diving in head first and filling up the swimming pool with water, if you reverse those two operations, you're going to get very different results. As I say, I don't suggest you try that. Hamilton's motivation for doing mathematics was the quest for beauty. He regarded mathematics as an aesthetic creation akin to poetry, with its own mysteries and moments of profound revelation. Now the beauty in mathematics relates to the beauty of ideas, and beauty is typically what motivates the great mathematicians to do mathematics. Hamilton actually was also a poet. He got published and he won prizes in poetry. Another important feature of mathematics that I'd like to mention here is freedom. As Cantor once said, freedom is the essence of mathematics. You see, mathematics exists in the world of ideas. And in the world of ideas, you're free to think of anything you want. For example, Hamilton was free to create quaternions, even though they broke mathematical conventions of the time. And the expression liberator algebra reflects the notion of freedom in mathematics. Hamilton quaternions have many important and powerful applications nowadays. 
for example, space navigation. In 2012, the Curiosity rover landed on Mars, and Quaternions were fundamental in that operation. Quaternions are also widely used in computer animation, computer games, computer graphics, and special effects in movies. Lara Croft in the famous computer game Tomb Raider was actually created using quaternions. Vector analysis, which is indispensable in physics, is an offspring of quaternions. Three-dimensional vectors are part of the four-dimensional quaternions. When Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves in 1864, he used quaternions. Shortly afterwards, Hertz detected radio waves by following Maxwell's ideas. And this would ultimately lead to the invention of the radio, the television, all sorts of telecommunications, and many important parts of our society. Now, Maxwell's prediction of electromagnetic waves illustrates the magical power of mathematics because radio waves are invisible to our five physical senses. Now maybe mathematics has this magical power because mathematics exists in the world of ideas and it comprises many ideas which are not limited by our five physical senses. The annual Hamilton Walk takes place in October the 16th and participants retrace Hamilton's steps by starting at Dunsink Observatory, where Hamilton lived, and strolling down to meet the Royal Canal at Ashtown train station. The walk then continues along the canal to the commemorative plaque at Broom Bridge in Cabra. The walk takes about 45 minutes. Many famous people have come on the walk. Andrew Wiles, who saw Fermi's last theorem, launched the walk one year. Fields medalists Timothy Gowers and Efim Zelmanov came on the walk and Nobel Prize winners in physics Murray Gelman, Steven Weinberg and Frank Wilczek have also participated in the walk. Also Hamilton's great-great-grandson Michael Regan came on the walk. Now Cabra Community Council have made the walk into a very festive affair at the bridge with a large banner about Hamilton draped across the bridge and stalls along the canal. The following quote from Aidan Don Perry of Cabra Community Council captures the positive impact of the walk on the Cabra community. Aidan said, the walk has had a huge impact on the local community. In fact, it has gone way beyond just being a walk because all the local school children and the community are extremely proud of Hamilton and their local connection with him. The walk really has touched the local people in a big way. The fact that famous mathematicians and Nobel Prize winners mingle with school children and the local community on the walk and at the bridge is a great experience. Also, Jack Gannon, a local Cabra resident, once said, on account of the walk, Hamilton is in the folk consciousness of the local people. Now, Jack actually wrote a song about Hamilton called The Ballad of Rowan Hamilton. And it's been played many times. This is a big year for the walk, actually, because it's been going for 30 years now since it started in 1990. As a nod to James Joyce's Ulysses, we sometimes call October the 16th Broom's Day because of the Broom Bridge connection. Actually, James Joyce mentioned quaternions in Finnegan's Wake. So I'd like to end up by reading a quote from Finnegan's Wake. Wondering was it Hebrew set to Himmeltones or the quicksilver song of quaternions. His troubles may be over, 
but his doubles have still to come. Slán, enjoy the virtual walk. And we've caught up again with uh, Professor Peter Gallagher from the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit more about DIAS and their uh, work at the observatory. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Um, the observatory has been here since 1785, you know, uh, built by Trinity. But but uh, it was taken over by Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies in 1947. Actually, it was Eamon de Valera who had a real love for mathematics and physics and astronomy. And he set up, in fact, the whole of Dias, but then purchased Dunsink uh, for Dias. Um, and, and we've been doing research, you know, building on what Hamilton did ever since. Um, it's space research, there's some mathematical research, there's some computational physics that goes on. Um, and I myself work on, you know, the sun and space weather as well. So, you know, lots of different areas of astrophysics are are worked on nowadays. Um, Tom Ray, my colleague, he, he works on star formation and planet formation, which is a really you know, hot topic at the moment, and he's involved in, in a, a really exciting mission, actually, that's going to be launched later this year, which is called the James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, and it will be launched by NASA. Um, I think the mirror on it is seven and a half meters uh, in diameter, so just think about how large that is, you know, it's the size of a house and uh, it, it's going to go out to a place called um, L2, which is um, in the shadow of the earth where, where, there's, where there's not much light from the sun and it's going to do really sensitive infrared observations looking for uh, places where planets are being formed in the universe, um, looking for disks where there might be, you know, disks around stars, where there might be planet formation. It's a really exciting time for, for that kind of research. Actually, Tom also builds detectors, and we actually have, I think we have the coldest room in the whole of Ireland in the basement of Fitzwilliam Place, which is where we also have uh, researchers. So actually, Dias has researchers in Fitzwilliam Place at, in Dublin City Centre. Um, so that we're close to some of our, our, our collaborators in, in UCD and Trinity in particular. And then we also have people based in Dunsink as well. So the group kind of goes back and forth between the two facilities. Um, who else? I guess um, Jonathan Mackey is uh, uh, one of our younger researchers. He has a research group in computational and high energy astrophysics physics. So he's interested in, in creating computer codes that can simulate stars, um, especially massive ones, ma very massive suns, many, 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 many times more massive than, than our sun. And he's interested in looking at their evolution and how they, how they live and how they die, in fact, how they explode. And he's also interested in these things called nebulae, which are gas gas clouds um, and within these gas clouds you can sometimes get shock waves being formed where you know one body of gas is slamming into an 
another body of gas. And he does all of that computationally um, with a student of his, uh, Sam Green, and also um, another student, Maria, is uh, working on, on that as well. Uh, actually, both nearly finished their, their PhDs or steadily working towards finishing their PhDs. Um, and he uses supercomputers to do that. So he uses uh, the Irish Centre for High End Computing's uh, facilities. Um, so that's great stuff. Um, a very fitting thing to do in Ireland because, you know, the astronomy ain't, is, is, is challenging with, with our kind of weather. Um, and we have a new staff member called Katrina Jackman, who's working on planetary magnetism. Spheres, and her group is is based at Dunsink, and some of them take the, this route here. You can see we're looking through the gates here, um, and uh, these gates lead down onto Dunson A Lane, and we actually have a proposal in at the moment to create what's called the Hamilton Way. Uh, and the idea of, of the Hamilton Way is that it would link from this lane here, this is called Dunson A Lane that you're seeing here, and it's only maybe a 10 minute walk down to Ashtown and the Royal Canal, and then behind you is the observatory about oh, 450 metres away, so maybe a, a five minute back walk back up. So we're hoping that um, Fingal County Council and Dublin City Council can help us uh, in achieving that, and that would really open up the observatory to you know, make it easier to get to for staff and students and also for members of the public and schools to come and visit the observatory either by walking or, or by, by bike. Of course, people can visit um, by car by coming up Dunsink Lane, but it's a longer trip for 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 uh, somebody on foot or, or, on, or on a bike. This would have been the, uh, the obvious route into the city because the route around by Dunsink Lane is quite long, isn't that right? Yeah, Hamilton would have taken this route actually, um, and uh, the astronomers and staff from the observatory uh, always walked down to the observatory for over 200, what is it, 235 years or something like that. They've been walking down across that field, down Dunson A Lane, um, and down to the canal. So this is the direct route in, and then it's a straight run in along the Royal Canal um, into kind of near the five lamps and across to Trinity or across to the Royal Irish Academy. And of course, Hamilton was president of the Royal Irish Academy and he was also professor of astronomy at Trinity and uh, gave the occasional lecture, I believe. Um, he wasn't one for, 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 for doing too much teaching, um, but uh, uh, spent uh, uh, any time he did visit the city, this is the route that he would have taken, so we're following in Hamilton's footsteps. So appropriate to call it the Hamilton Way as well. Yeah, and we go, it uh, it passes over the uh, uh, the Talca River and then on up to the canal. And of course the canals, canals by their nature are straight and level so it was a great walkway into Dublin. Yeah and actually one of the reasons that um, uh, when Usher was uh, he was the first professor of astronomy and uh, after Andrews left money Provost Andrews left money to create a professorship of astronomy and found the observatory and he looked at a variety of different sites he looked in Wicklow uh, he looked into the Wicklow Mountains, he looked at Hoth, um, and he also looked out west. And, and one of the reasons he went to Dunsink was it was an isolated hill on its own, so gravity was nice and simple, um, whereas in the mountains of, of, of in the Wicklow Mountains, it would have been difficult and challenging to make his observations. But also, so the canal was being built at the same time, so it was much easier to get out to this part of Dublin. So it's eight kilometres from Dublin city centre. So it was just an easier place 
to get to. And at that stage, of course, there was actually there still is, uh, there still are stables in behind Dunsink Observatory. And I think the astronomer probably would have rode a horse um, in along the the uh, the canal and, and into the city centre. And it's still a lovely route to take. I, I cycle it or walk it reg regularly myself. Maybe I'll mention at this point um, a little bit more of of the research uh, that that we do uh, at the uh, at, at Dias, um, I, my yeah. own group works on solar physics and space weather, and uh, I, I briefly mentioned Katrina Jackman as well, who's our new staff member. She's supported by Science Foundation Ireland, and she's created a large team. But we're interested in the sun, uh, so solar activity, and there's large explosions on the sun called mass ejections or solar storms, and they fling electrons and protons and magnetic fields out into space. And as they travel through space, they can sometimes hit the Earth, they can hit you know, Mars, and they can hit uh, Jupiter and Saturn and so on. And what, what my group does is we understand and try to understand the physics of the origins of these explosions. And try to better forecast them but in order to do that we need to understand their physics and then we forecast where they go in space by understanding their kinematics and that's something that Hamilton actually worked on on the kinematics and the rotation of objects in three dimensions and that's something we still continue to work on and then Katrina takes that uh, that those uh, observations and those models that we will run and then she looks at how they impact the magnetosphere of, of Jupiter in particular. So Jupiter has this enormous um, magnetic field, like a huge bar magnet, but, but billions of times bigger. But it protects uh, uh, the, the Jovian atmosphere from radiation from the sun. And uh, she, she works on a spacecraft called Cassini, actually. Actually, she works on Juno and Cassini and lots of other spacecrafts, but they're observing the solar wind and how it affects Jupiter. So it's wonderful to hear about the uh, wonderful research still going on in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And wonderful to see them still using Dunsink as an important base and to know that the mathematical descendants of Hamilton are, are uh, thriving. It's important when we talk about historical figures in maths that we emphasize that uh, the work is still going on today but hopefully their example can inspire a new generation. It's a beautiful day to walk along the canal and we think of Helen and William all those years back and wonder about their own relationship and William's personal life. And we're joined by Anne van Verden from Utrecht University to talk to us about William Rowan Hamilton's private life. About the marriage the Quaternions were born into. Sir William Rowan Hamilton was born in 1805 in Dominic Street in Dublin as the fourth child of Archibald and Sarah Hamilton. They already had lost two sons before Hamilton was born, and after him they would have five more children, of whom again two did not survive childhood. Death was always near in Victorian times. Inevitably, already in his youngest years, Hamilton's am amazing intellect showed itself, and around his third birthday, he was sent to Trim to be educated by his uncle James and his aunt, 
around Sydney Hamilton. Hamilton saw his own family regularly, and many amazed letters about him were written in Dublin and in Trim. It can be read that it was a loving and supportive family, and that Hamilton had a happy childhood. Hamilton lost his mother in 1817, when he was 12, and his father in 1819, when he was 15. After their mother's death, relatives took over the care of the four Hamilton sisters, while Hamilton stayed in Trim, but the siblings would often meet each other in the house of a cousin in Dublin. After an astonishing intellectual development, Hamilton's entrance to Trinity College Dublin was planned in January 1823. But in April 1822, he contracted whooping cough, from which he only very slowly recovered. His entrance was postponed until July 1823. His accompanying bronchitis whether it was the cause or the effect of his whooping cough, remained with him his whole life and hindered him in his practical astronomy. In his early days as astronomy professor being often outside in the night, he regularly became ill and after some years he left the general observing to his assistant, only observing special events like comets and eclipses. Of course, as seen from our, our perspective, the cloud of his bronchitis had a silver lining. It allowed him to focus almost completely on his mathematics, which gave birth to his Hamiltonian mechanics and to his quaternions, both discoveries we now all profit from. After an again a Astonishing first year at Trinity College, in August 1824, Uncle James took Hamilton with him to Summerhill House, where he for the first time met Catherine Disney. Hamilton immediately fell hopelessly in love with Catherine. He often visited Summerhill and he befriended some of her brothers, who were fellow students at Trinity College. After some very happy months, in February 1825, her mother completely unexpectedly told him that Catherine was going to marry in May. Not knowing that she was forced by her family to marry someone else while being in love with him, Hamilton wished her a very happy life in a farewell poem he did not send her. The Victorian era was very secretive about marriage, and only slowly, in the course of many years, while he had already married happily himself, Hamilton discovered that Catherine was very unhappy. Every time he heard that she was even more unhappy than he already knew, he was understandably distressed. Catherine could not accept her fate, and in 1848 she attempted suicide. She survived and was allowed to live with family members, but only for as long as she needed to recover. But she did not recover, and five years later she was dying. She asked Hamilton to meet her for a last time, and in two interviews she could finally tell him that she had always loved him and had wanted to marry him, but that her family had coerced her into marriage. That was extremely hard for Hamilton to hear, and it took him months to recover. Still, it did not undermine his own marriage. Lady Hamilton had always known about Catherine, and there's no sign that she did not care about Catherine's terrible fate. Returning in this short story to 1825, after having lost Catherine so unexpectedly, Hamilton tried to bury himself in his mathematics and bear his fate with a stoic calm.
That, of course, is not very wise, and it indeed took him years to cope with it. Then, in September 1831, he met Ellen de Vere, who lived at Cara Chase, and being very happy to talk with her about poetry and astronomy, he fell in love with her. He would later write to a friend that his love for her had been as deep as that for Catherine, but that the difference was that in Catherine's case he learned so late of her engagement. In December 1831, he wanted to propose to Ellen, but before he could speak, she rejected him. Hamilton fell into a very deep melancholy, and this time he could not find his stoic calm. People around him became very worried. That all changed when in the summer of 1832, Hamilton made a most remarkable psychological discovery. He saw that he was living a passion-wasted life and found a way to pull himself out of his melancholy. Some weeks later he wrote to his new friend Aubrey de Vere, Ellen's younger brother, that his tone of mind and even health of body was restoring and that the power of hope had revived. In renewed health, late in October or early in November 1832, Hamilton fell in love with Helen Bailey. She was of pleasing ladylike appearance, and he had known her for some years already. Valuing truth very highly, Hamilton was looking for a truthful wife, and because of his aim to reach the summit of the beautiful temple of science, she also had to be retired, yet able to give him the comfort of love and being close by when he was in one of his mathematical trances. Moreover, Hamilton was deeply religious, and she thus had to be very pious. That was what he found in Helen Bailey, and having known her for years already, he knew he was not mistaken. He wrote many love poems for and about her, and sent his antenuptial poems to Samuel Coleridge. If Hamilton's love for Helen Bailey would need any proof, then that certainly can serve as one. And she also was in love with him. Some months after the wedding, she wrote to her mother, Indeed, any woman is blessed to be married to such an affectionate, kind creature as Hamilton. They married on the 9th of April, 1833, in Berliner Cloak Church, and thereafter they lived at Dunsink Observatory. Of course, they had good and bad times, as we all have, but according to Hamilton's biographer, they remained attached to each other for the rest of their life. That was the happy marriage which allowed for the peaceful walk along the canal on that remarkable October day, now 177 years ago, and for Hamilton's Eureka moment. The Quaternions were born to happy parents. So we're nearly through with our walk, and on the last leg of our walk, we're going to be joined by the man who dreamt it up 30 years ago and together with Fiacra has kept it going for 30 years and hopefully it'll go on for decades and centuries to come. My name is Tony O'Farrell and I started this walk back in 1990 and um, it's been going ever since. Fiacro Caraba looks after all the uh, staff work and organization and has kept it going over the years. I tell stories to the young people that I meet on the walk and um, they're not true really. They're much more important than that. Here we are walking along the Royal Canal. The canal is famous in song and story. Everyone knows the Bean song about the old triangle. Across the river, across the canal, you have the Great Western Railway that used to be. And um, they were building that, or maybe they had it built when Hamilton was walking here in 1843. 
reminds me of the song in 1844 I landed on the Liverpool shore my belly was empty my hands were sore from working on the railway the railway I'm weary of the railway Poor Paddy works on the railway. Now, why was Paddy working on the railway in Liverpool? Well, in 1844, things started to get tough. The event we're, commun we're commemorating today happened the year before the Great Famine stopped. So it's a sad time, this COVID. We've lost so many people. And in, in the mathematical world, we've lost such wonderful researchers. John Conway, perhaps more than anyone else, stands out as a terrible loss to this terrible disease. But what can we do? We live in hope. What we do here on this day is a kind of cross between ritual and performance art. Normally we'd stand here, I'd stand here surrounded by a couple of hundred people, school children, and lovers of mathematics, lovers of lovers of mathematics, children of lovers of mathematics, and our friends from the Cabra County Council and the Royal Canal Amenity Group, Old Faithfuls, and uh, we'd celebrate this business. The unique thing about this particular mathematical discovery is that we have so much information about the circumstances. Archimedes is supposed to have made a big discovery when he was in the baths and leaped up and ran through the streets shouting Eureka, but there are other occasions Poincaré as he stepped off a bus on his holidays had a sudden illumination and invented the Fuchsian groups. But for this one we have the place and the time and the circumstances. And we'd have a spot prize. Usually I like to get people thinking about quaternion arithmetic and try to do some with that equation. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one. For example, what's the square of one plus I plus J plus K? Or what's the square root of uh, minus one? How many things are in the square root of minus one? depends on the age and of the, the group. On the Sunday we might just have adults and we ask something complicated. But we can't do that today. So I would suggest two things. There's one of the happy things we do normally is to see who's come furthest. Last year we had a group of schoolgirls from Monterrey, Mexico, who won that particular competition. Someone else from the Persian Gulf was in competition, but Monterey is further. And um, perhaps this year, with a worldwide audience, there are people in the Antipodes who can take part, who are taking part in this, and maybe you can let the organizers know about it. And since we can't scratch things on the bridge, my proposal this year is that what people do is they take a nail, a three inch or a four inch nail, and they scratch the formula on any convenient stone or concrete surface. Or they take anything else, like a spray can or a lipstick or something, and write it, write it out. Let's have 100,000 copies of this formula all over the place. Eamon de Valera wrote it over his jail cell. 
when he was awaiting possible execution in 1916. And uh, it's written across the way there at the railway station on the ground. There's a sculpture by Miss Ray put up last year, put down last year. It's flat on the ground with the formula in lights. Do that. Fiacro Carabra had the happy idea of calling this Broom's Day because this bridge was Broom Bridge, named after one of the directors of the Canal Company, and um, renamed, of course, Hamilton Bridge by the City Council back in 1950-something. And um, so this is uh, mathematics's answer to Bloomsday, the 16th of June, the day when we celebrate mathematical creativity and invention. There's usually some kind of a surprise on this day, some new artwork, a poem, a song, a book of songs, a book of poems. painting. Theatre has documented a long list of quaternion-related art in an article that he wrote for the Bulletin of the Irish Mathematical Society a little while ago. And I don't have anything like this that I know about at the moment. So I thought I could try to lift the gloom a little bit by being positive about things. Back in 2004, there was a rumour that Erin Road Erin were planning to close the commuter station on the railway here at Broombridge because the numbers commuting were considered insufficient. And this prompted me to write to the editor of the bulletin pointing out that there's a concentration of quaternions here and the majority of these just won't commute and cannot be persuaded to do so. Well, here we are at the bridge. I wish I had you all here. If I had you all here, this is what I would say. Falcha, Gachenya, Falcha, Acharja. This bridge is famous all over the world. Mathematicians everywhere know about it. Sometimes they don't even know where it is, but they know there's a bridge. The rituals are three or four. First of all, we sing, Happy Birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Quaternions. Happy birthday to you. Then we get the youngest person here to scratch the formula yet again on the bridge. And hopefully we'll all be able to meet in person here next year.
very welcome. What a wonderful walk commemorating that momentous occasion. I've been lucky enough to go on the walk myself and it's just such a wonderful experience to retrace the steps and the walk of William Rowan Hamilton on that wonderful day. I have to apologize for the poor network quality along the canal. I guess that's something that Hamilton was lucky enough to, to not to have to worry about all those days ago. We'll be posting the full recording of this on the Maths Week website, which is www.mathsweek.ie. We're really looking forward to next year's Maths Week and to next year's Hamilton Walk. We hope the weather is as good as it was this year. And we hope we can all be together again to retrace those, that wonderful journey. Thank you.